We're just going to give everybody 60 seconds more. And then we will make a start. So first of all, my apologies for not being able to send the link for the last session yet. It's taking about 14 hours to process because it's a really long talk. So uh, please accept my humble apologies, but I think the limits of my computer speed, which is an I-9, have kind of been reached, so I apologize. My gut feeling is by tomorrow morning, I'll be able to send you that talk, and hopefully this, this session by day after tomorrow morning. So please do bear with me. Uh, I'm just going to go over what we have done so far. So we're two weeks into the course now, and uh, we've basically been able to revise and do ultrasound physics in a great deal of detail with uh, a look at the different kinds of artifact. But uh, today's session is basically going to cover standardization nomenclature with a little bit of revision of the different types of artifact that we are gonna be standardly interpreting as part of our journey in learning lung ultrasound. But as of this week, we finished the first part of the lung ultrasound module and uh, technically move on to the abnormal lung from next week, uh, where I will then be covering along with a host of other very eminent speakers, uh, including Dr. Abhijit, uh, Nadia, Adel, the different pathologies that we see. Now, uh, I think what is very important from our perspective is that up till now we've been able to repeat quite a few of the talks, but in particular, the, the guest speaker talks, uh, they will not be repeated and you will have to watch them on the portal if you actually miss them. So my humble request at this particular stage is where possible, try not to miss the guest speaker talks, but you must watch them on the portal if you've missed them. Uh, these are some of the, the, the best faculty in the world. You know, each and every one of the faculty here have a, a very, very uh, good handle uh, of the subject. And uh, I've learned from all of them. So I can't emphasize enough how it, important it is that, you know, where possible, if you're, you're not able to attend those sessions that you try to see them in sequence. So I'm gonna make a start. So we have uh, three colleagues who will be presenting today. So I am going to make Doris co-host. And Doris, can I ask you to share your screen, please? Okay, I'm just going to try and share. That's beautiful. So your screen is visible. You can go into slideshow mode. You're visible and audible. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, I wanted to start by showing you a machine. So this is our ultrasound machine, and um, we have a hockey stick, um, which is what um, I have been using for the cases. Um, and and uh, these are the preset machine settings. I have not changed them for now. I guess I will wait to hear what you have to say, Alok, um, about the images and subsequent ones. Um, okay, so I'll start with the first case. Um, I must confess that the images look better on the machine <laughs> than on my slides, but I mean, uh, you'll just see how it goes. Now, so this, um, the first case is a term baby, three kilograms at birth. Um, there was an uneventful um, antenatal history. So all we know was that this baby was born by normal vaginal delivery. And there was a history of meconium at birth and the um, baby subsequently developed respiratory distress, which worsened and he eventually was in 100% oxygen. So was ventilated, um, given a dose of Curacef, 200 milligrams per kilo, started on nitric oxide and transferred to a level three unit in 100% oxygen with pressures of up to 35. Um, when he came, we started adrenaline, continued nitric, and um, his um, initial CRP was 37. There was really no history of sepsis from the information given mom was well. 
Um, there was no prolonged rupture of membranes, so it was a bit puzzling. But his CRP rose to 148. He was on benzopenicillin and gentamicin. And um, the, at the time of this scan was done at day three of life. So his, his oxygen requirement was said to, to have improved. It came down to about 60%. Um, when this x-ray, the day before this x-ray was taken, sorry, the day before this, the long ultrasound was taken, this was his x-ray at birth. So you can appreciate um, um, the pneumonitis that, that you can see on the x-ray. I took a picture of this, so it may be a little bit grainy, but this is what the x-ray looked like. Um, so my scans um, were opportunistic. I thought it was a good case to try and do an ultrasound scan on, um, a long ultrasound scan on. So I did the scan for him. At the point I did this scan, he was in 100% oxygen maximum support and was quite unwell. Sorry. Ah, okay. Um, so these were the first images. Let's see if they would play. All right, so this was, uh, I, I couldn't move him much. So these are all the anterior scans that I could do. So um, the first scan in the right um, anterior, right upper anterior um, chest region. Sorry, I did try to loop them anyway. Um, so you can see um, the plural. Yeah. It doesn't yep. seem continuous. Um, yeah, it is continuous. It looks a little bit, my scan, my images look a little bit grainy, so I must apologize for that. No, no. Yeah. Please don't apologize. These images are beautiful. So you, can I just ask you recording the screen? Sorry? Are you recording your screen? No, I'm not. Am I supposed to? Uh, no, no. So uh, have you downloaded this or are you recording the image for ah. the phone? So I, I recorded it for my phone because I didn't okay. know how to download it. So yeah. all these are... So, so you have a GE, right? The Vivid. Yeah, yes, it yeah. is. Okay, so uh, it's really easy and you can anonymize them. So all you have to do is once you've completed the scan, mm. you have to go to Image Viewer on the right-hand top side. Yes. On Image Viewer, you click it and mm. what you'll have is a select all image. Yes. You click select all, export to USB, oh. and it will automatically anonymize your images. The GE, when you export to USB, automatically okay. anonymizes all images. When you export them, export them as AVIs. As AVIs. Let me write that down. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty easy. I tried and nobody could help me, so I just use my phone to take yeah. um, So if you're using a GE uh, Vivid, and the GE is one of the best machines in the world, it's it's really simple. So you should be able to download all those images and it will automatically anonymize them. Okay, splendid. Okay, I will do that and for the rest yep. of the cases. So just to comment again, just like we're looking at two images, you've got five centimeter worth of depth. And what you've got is below the four centimeter mark, you've basically got what is a lot of depth there. So mm -hmm. actually that bit, beyond 4.5 centimeters is redundant. So actually a depth of four centimeters would be fine. It would give you your entire lung field. But in terms of your image quality, you've got the pleura, you've got two ribs. Uh, you Probably if you could try and get a third rib, but that's going to be challenging because you're using a hockey stick, which has a small footprint. Yeah. So really what you might have to do is you might have to do a few more images for the R1. So starting at the top, using your hockey stick, just going down, to get two spaces, two spaces, and you probably will end up with two images for R1, two images for R2. But this looks beautiful. So again, you've got really nice sliding in R1. Mm. And what you've got here is what is a compact B-line coming down. Yeah. yeah. So a really nice compact B-line with the B-lines having fused. Uh, on the right-hand side of that image, the plural looks irregular. Yeah. So just over there. So if yeah. you just press the image again. So not only is it irregular, you've got the pleura dropping away with a very irregular margin. So that is basically what is called a fractal sign. Okay. Or a, a, a very small, uh, what I would call is a dropout sign, uh, which uh, we, we commonly see uh, if you think there's probably a small mnemonic consolidation there. So that's, that's very nice images. So we can go to your R2 image. Okay. So, um, so so this is the R2 image. We can see the plural here too. Um, it looks um, regular and smooth compared to the previous um, image. 
and um, we can appreciate B lines, yeah, especially in this um, field. And I can see some A lines um, also. And the there is plural sliding. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, beneath the plu, I mean, beneath the plural, um, this area, I, well, I mean, knowing his background history, whether I'll call this sub pulmonic consolidation. Um, so if you could just press the image again. So you've got you've got two ribs visible. Uh, yeah. You've got dropout behind this rib. Uh, so on the right side. So if you just take your cursor up to the right-sided rib, so there's dropout behind it. And really what you've got is when you go to the, the left side, at the top you have plural lines. Mm. And then what you've got is you've got an area which basically looks very dense. Mm. So that is a consolidation. Uh, again, what I'd say is there's no irregularity or breakdown at the subtural margin, but yeah, that is a that is a subtural. That's quite a large consolidation there with a few a lines in between. Mm. Uh, can I just ask on the right side? So on on the right side, mm. uh, where are you? Do you know which rib spaces you're in? You're in the lower rib spaces. I'm in the lower rib space, I, below the nipple. Okay, below that's fine. Nipple. Yeah, yeah, so I tried to yeah. Okay. That's great. I mean, this looks like a liver shadow to me, possibly. Yes, it's a little I bit difficult. So. Yeah, that's the liver. So yeah. just above that, you've got the lower half of the lung. What I'd say is, I mean, I'm assuming this baby was about three, three and a half kilos. Yes. So my gut feeling is for like a comprehensive scan, you'd have to take multiple views of R1 and R2, mm. probably at least two or three each, because you mm. want to cover longitudinal scanning in all the anterior rib spaces. Okay. And the reason you're getting such a small square image is because you're using a hockey stick. Now, if you had the linear probe, uh, mm -hmm. I would recommend that you use the linear probe. Yeah. The other thing is uh, you're getting good depth here because you're using a low frequency probe, which is appropriate. You might, in my opinion, and you can on the GE, you mm -hmm. can change the frequency from the preset setting. So I have recorded a video, again, that uh, I can share with you for the GE. So on the bottom of the GE screen, where you have frequency, the frequency would have been set at eight. Okay. That round button, you have to press it. Okay. And you can change the frequency from seven, which is your preset setting, yep. right up. And I would say that if you were using it for an extremely preterm or a preterm baby, I would try to get the frequency up to 11, 12. But for a term baby, a frequency of at least eight to nine okay. would be better, would probably give you a little bit better image resolution. Okay. But these images are beautiful. Oh, thank you. So we can uh, carry on. Okay. So then R3, I also tried to get um, R3, the right um, upper axillary region. So as you can see also, you can see the plural clearly. Um, the Beautiful. Plural looks regular and smooth. There is plural sliding. We can see A lines, and then, but a lot of B lines. And it looks like these B lines are um, compact. Very good. But, yeah, but there is quite a lot of B lines. But I can clearly see A lines. So maybe I'll describe this profile as a B profile. Um, Completely. I yeah. would be happy with that. Yeah. Okay. And then I tried to get um, the R for the lower axilla region. Um, it was a bit difficult with the hockey stick. And <clears throat> so I was trying to try, try not to get the lever, but I just thought I'll give it a try. And then you can see the plural. Um, the plural is, I don't know how to describe it as, as, um, as smooth. I think maybe it's because I had dropouts. That's why it looks like this. I could appreciate some A lines um, also and some B lines. Um, there okay. are not a lot of B lines compared to R3, but. So this is an absolutely beautiful image. The reason for that is uh, you, in this image on the right side, can we go to the plural line, please? Yeah. Okay. Can you see how the plural line is split? Yeah. So uh, just yeah. go to the left of the screen at the top. That's plural line. Mm. And then you've got this area of low acoustic shadow with a plural line below that. Mm. This is classically described in the literature as a C line. I'll talk to you about it today. 
I thought it was an error, so I kept trying and trying, but I couldn't change no. it. It's a C line, uh, and I'll explain exactly what that is. But yeah, again, what you can classically see is you can see A lines. Uh, so if you just press that again, uh, I don't see a B profile here because I don't see B lines extending all the way to the bottom, but that might be because of what is visible on your screen. Your screen might show that, but I think what you can classically see in this case on the right side is a differential kind of clinical picture of A profile, B profile, a mix, lung consolidation, an element of at least one area that looks like a fractal or a shred sign. So multiple different areas uh, in the setting of a baby who has meconium. Yeah. That is that I would say is how you make the diagnosis of meconium aspiration syndrome and that there is classical mix of A, B, uh, C profiles, which I'll talk about today. And clearly this mix, obviously from our perspective, changes with time. So if you did serial ultrasounds, uh, and you initially did an ultrasound maybe on day one, what you might find is more of a B and C profile with a lot of consolidation, a lot of B profile and a lack of A lines because you have a lack of aeration. Mm -hmm. And then you give surfactant and you repeat this kind of scan 12 hours later and you end up with aeration. So you start getting A lines. Mm -hmm. I think what is important in this particular situation is that uh, as time goes by and healing takes place, uh, you can see better aeration of the lungs with kind of a transition to more of a kind of an A, AB profile over time. But if there's infection in the background, what you will classically see, which I will cover with mnemonic consolidation, is areas of broken pleura with severe subpleural consolidations with a very broken margin, which we classically call shred sign. Mm -hmm. So I do you have uh, the R5 and R6? Um, no, I no, that's fine. That's fine. You don't want to trouble the baby. And I, I, I think that's absolutely appropriate. So, you know, uh, we, we, we kind of, from my perspective, have uh, uh, really nice images. Let's, let's do L1, L2. Yeah. Okay. So this is L1. Um, so we can see the plural. I think this is the hot shadow, isn't it? I did try as much as possible to move the probe. So I was still picking up the, I mean, the hot shadow. Yeah. And what, what I'd suggest for this is you're quite lateral, probably near the nipple. And really what you want to do for this is when you're doing your longitudinal scanning, come medial to the nipple, medial to the nipple, okay. medial to the nipple if you're doing R1. Okay. And then what I'd say is that when you're doing R2 in particular, you have to be medial to the nipple. Medial. And that will help you get your R1, R2 images nicely. Okay. Uh, I would say that you, you can get... Uh, R1 images even lateral to the nipple. So I apologize, I'm, I'm using wrong. It's L1 and L2. So for L1 and L2 images, try to be medial to the nipple and direct your probe uh, medial to the nipple and you'll be able to get the L1 image. Sometimes it's very difficult, in particular, if you have a large heart to actually be able to get your L2 image well. So again, medial and you might just have to go lateral to try and get that image. But what I can see over here is uh, in the superior part of this image, you've classically got what is plura, but mm -hmm. I just wonder whether that's a consolidation. Uh, this, just, this. No, yeah, this one. Absolutely. Not, not this one. So the left, that side there. And then lower down on the right side, yeah, that area there, that's definite consolidation. So you've got patchy consolidation. Uh, if you press the image, just play again. So you've got plural with A lines, and then you've got this consolidation that's looking nice and bright over here. It's a deep consolidation. So if you could just put your arrow on it again, that's a deep consolidation. So again, patchy aeration, definite plural sliding, but with a consolidation, which is deep. So beautiful image, Doris, beautiful image. Thank you. And then L2 below the nipple anteriorly, um, this is what I got. I can still appreciate plural sliding. Um, I, so these are A lines. Yep. Um, this um, B lines don't reach the bottom. So maybe I'll, I would say these are comet tail. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. These are comet tails. And I think what I'd say is just in the middle of the screen at the two centimeter mark. Hmm. Can you see the two centimeter mark? So come down yep. there, that, that is probably a consolidation. Mm. It's not a clear A line. 
Uh, I think an A-line would be very, uh, I would say like the Poodle line and in parallel. For me, that's a consolidation. Okay. And what about yeah. these two? Same? So, what, play it again. I think that's an A-line. I think that's an A-line. There may be an element of consolidation as well. Mm. But yeah. So again, you've got some static air bronchograms. If you go back to the plate again, play the two centimeter line, you can see these bright areas, they're static bronchograms. So you've got differential aeration. Again, a lot of differential aeration, but beautiful images. Uh, and just for everybody's knowledge, I mean, this is the same case that uh, uh, my colleague uh, Nas presented. Uh, it's fantastic to kind of see the progress of the case over time and that the quorum aspiration takes a long time to heal. And clearly what you'll find is you'll have different patterns over a period of time. But what you can see here, and I think if you'd seen Nas's images, you had a very, very dominant B profile in that. Whereas here now you can see patchy aeration of the lungs. That's excellent. Uh, just in the interest of time, okay. uh, you've got one more case to present. Uh, yeah, but yeah. But if I just Go for it. Images, Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. That's um, absolutely fine. L3 Let's... L3 and four. Um, same baby, L3 and yeah. four. Sorry. All right. Yeah, volume. So again, L4. L4. Can we just press L4? L4. So again, can you see the aeration in L4? It's beautiful. And can you see how you've got A lines at the, mm -hmm. you've got pleura at the top with parallel A lines, a very nice aerated lateral region of the lung. But L3 just on top. So if you press L3, so again, plura compact B lines. Yep. So you can see how you have such a significant differential pattern with differential mm -hmm. aeration of different parts of the lung. Beautiful yeah. images. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was quite fascinated that I thought I mean the images will all be uniformly uh, show uniform consolidation, but it's not. I, so that's why I just took all of them. Okay. So the second case that's just it's um, brief also. Yeah, I, no problems. I I was just opportunistic. I thought it was a good one to try to um, do a long ultrasound. So this one was an extremely preterm baby born at 23 weeks, weighing 540, 545 grams. Um, had a mantinate of steroids, magnesium sulfate, um, um, born by SVD, had a dose of Kirosep, and I was hypotensive on day one. So the first day of life, um, the honeymoon, honeymoon period was in 25 to 30% oxygen, um, four to five, five mils per kilo of um, volume guarantee, and then was uh, minimally ventilated with I mean, minimal pressures of about 18 over five. Um, so this um, ultrasound was done on day two and um, less than 24 hours after I developed pulmonary hemorrhages was on HFO in 100% oxygen and had bilateral grade four IVH. So this, um, the scan, the long ultrasounds were done whilst the baby had pulmonary hemorrhages. So I could only take two views, that's R1 and L1. I couldn't um, look anything else because the baby was so unstable. Um, so this is R1. And um, so as you can see, um, the pleura um, looks irregular. And um, I would say um, broken in different areas. And you can appreciate the preponderance of B lines. Yeah, I can't see much of A lines. And I could see these areas, that, as I, which I would say could possibly be um, consolidation. Um, but the, the Appearance was like whiteout, so I would appreciate. I would say that this um, uh, compact B lines clearly from this. Now the L1 image was also um, the same, just like this. There was really no difference to this. Yeah, so that that's all I was going to show. I couldn't take any more images okay. because baby was too unwell. So as you can see, extremely preterm baby. What's your CRP, please? Oh, the CRP was fine. The CRP did not even rise up to ten. Okay. So this was on the background of pulmonary hemorrhage was in 100% oxygen on HFO. Sure, sure. So what you can classically see, very nice images again, uh, very good depth, beautiful depth, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I think you can see a very irregular plural line. The plural is broken in areas. Again, yep. what you're seeing is elements of fractal sign, but with predominant subplural consolidations. Mm. Uh, these areas basically show up a severe B profile 
with i would say basically an ais kind of pattern because even the consolidated kind of compact d lines have merged together mm-hmm. and i think if you were to see this kind of pattern in virtually every lung field on that right side we classically call this a white out lung well, yeah. which is what you'd see with a pulmonary hemorrhage in this particular situation so again there's no evidence of variation because you can't see any a lines uh, just uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, on the right side there you see uh, no 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 going further up just in the middle 2.5 cm mm-hmm. you see what might have been some a lines previous to that that might be an a line but completely obscured now by what is a b profile mm-hmm. so i mean clearly you've hemorrhaged to the point where you've developed uh, a white out ais pattern mm-hmm. i think what i'd say is that pulmonary hemorrhage predominantly presents like this uh, what i would say is it sometimes is very difficult to differentiate from simple severe rds itself but okay. the fact that you've kind of got an irregular pleural line with some areas of breakdown at the top of the lung with a fractal sign i'd be very interested to kind of see what your crp does in due course now again with a pulmonary hemorrhage your crp will go up mm. you know if it was kind of 15 20 your baby's healed i i would assume you're still on antibiotics Mm, well yes <laughs> yes yeah yeah i mean at least in the part of the world that i currently practice in we can't risk it but mm-hmm. i think if your crp went up to 100 plus you really the question that i'm asking is i mean what's triggered this so have we done an echo is there a big duct um so we did you do an echo we did an echo initially and um, those high pulmonary vascular resistance um mm. so we did not have the time to interrogate the duct yet We developed for that complications and had to be transferred to to a surgical yep. center so for review okay. so that's my yeah. apologies my yeah. apologies yeah. sorry hello yeah. may may i have a question just for on this uh, image yeah sure please go for it and so just i noticed that the cursor it's on the left it's normal like this oops sorry confirmed i know that so the cursor is the v at the top that's on the right that's on the yeah that's on the right yeah yeah so it's on the left for you because of the way the image is being photographed on the phone i think if you take an a clip you'd be able to see it that way because the phone inverts the image do you get what i'm saying yes yes thank you i okay okay here here thank you okay uh, so uh, just uh, to... sir. yeah sorry yeah carry on yeah <laughs> Uh, sir, uh, below the pleural line, uh, like we are seeing, this is a subpleural consolidation, right? That's correct. That's correct. And pleural pleural... space and pleural break breakage is also present. Hmm? That's correct. You also have a fractal or a shed sign there. Yes, yes very sir, small yes. ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. Now, just gonna answer a few questions because we got a lot of questions from the audience. Just going through them. Uh, so. uh clearly doris's images have generated a lot of interest which is what we really want to do we want to learn from them and i'm learning from them so uh r3 to have a double lung point in the first image uh i don't think so my gut feeling at that particular point is what you basically got is differential kind of clinical picture of different areas merging so i prefer not to use the double lung point terminology uh nas is us to ribs look different in preterm as compared to term babies no the only thing that you'll see if you look at the preterm versus the term babies depending on your probe you're getting more ribs in the same space mm-hmm. and that's because you get a bigger footprint in a preterm baby so the ribs would not look any different you'd still get problems with the caustic shadow beyond them so you know uh they they would not uh sarah has asked the lungs look very dense correct uh it's it's a white out i would agree but by definition and i will be covering that today when you look at one lung field r1 or r2 and you see this kind of pattern we call it ais but when you look at and if you look at the definitions by jing lu he kind of says that if you see this in all six lung fields on the right or the left side then he would call this a white lung pattern so for all practical purposes you should see this pattern in all lung fields this for it to be correct uh could this uh, mike is asked could this image be seen in pneumonia uh, yes it could if you had a previous pneumonia and the pneumonia is called a pulmonary hemorrhage then absolutely but how you'd find that out is by doing serial imaging so if you had a, a preterm baby who had an rds like pattern which was improving 
and you kind of had fractal or shred sign and clinically correlating you had a high crp you had a baby who was sick maybe on inotropes who then had a pulmonary hemorrhage then can you see how clinical correlation and serial lung ultrasound would be more beneficial much more beneficial in being able to tell you that because at the moment what i don't know is whether this fractal sign or shred sign which has been described with pulmonary hemorrhage as well is just part of immature lungs with a pulmonary hemorrhage or whether there is an element of infection here which will become apparent later on so that is where the clinical course the clinical correlation the bloods the markers all of that will help us in making this differentiation now sir has asked about heparinization this is not it, it's not it's hepatization is the word that is used and no this is not hepatization this is just a white out lung appearance hepatization gives you a kind of a tissue like appearance and the tissue like appearance is best seen by looking at the liver so if you actually look at the liver you'll find that this is actually brighter more homogeneous whereas the liver basically gives you a it is homogeneous but gives you kind of a tissue like architectural appearance and hepatization uh, would uh, kind of reflect that kind of a consistency no don't worry sir absolutely fine no bad typing yeah so i am going to uh, uh, thank doris for absolutely some beautiful images uh, thank you so much doris for sharing these cases i am uh, just going to invite my next colleague to present who's dr vaz so dr vaz please share your screen Is it visible? My, it is visible. Yep, and you're okay. audible. Okay. Uh, sorry, I I'm not copying Doris, but it's it's also a meconium standard amniotic fluid. Uh, it's a term baby. Uh, the mother was a GBS positive with an incomplete prophylaxis. The membrane rupture was. Um, Four hours before birth, and it was a, a meconium standard amniotic fluid. It was a vaginal delivery. The baby born pretty well, and um, it started immediately with the respiratory distress, polypnea, hypoxemia, need of oxygen, and it was connected to high flow nasal cannula and started in antibiotics. This was the X ray in the immediately after birth. It's not so bad than the previous we, we saw, but we can appreciate the patchy infiltrates in all the pulmonar. And I, I give a um, lung ultrasound where we can see that the pleural line is a good sliding. But and can I ask which, which machine are you using? It's a GE. Beautiful. I mean, yeah. I just, uh, I wish everybody could have that machine or the sound site. It's a beautiful image. Thank you so much. It's a, a old one, but it's. A, it's a, um, I think that we can say that the pleural line is not so linear. It's a bit disrupted, and I think that we have some superior consolidations also, um, and uh, we have a, a pattern of B lines compact in some beautiful. areas. I think this is too fast, but I think we can see the supleural consolidations here. Yep, very nice. And some nice. A lines, some A lines. So the not homogeneous pattern of the lung. And here is R3 with B lines, compact, some A lines, sometimes the A lines appear. I think here we don't have that superior consolidations. And on the left, we have A lines, the pleural line also with these interrupted, maybe small consolidations. And here, I think we have a Superal consolidation that we can see better, and A lines, 
A lines and some B lines here. And L3 a bit better if A lines. Fortunately, this baby is still on high flow nasal cannula and never worsed. So he had a, a very good uh, recuperation. So I'm going to just, uh, it, these are beautiful images, but Mayank, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Mayank, look at L3. So, uh, Anna, if you could just play, play L3 again. This is a classical double lung point. So can you okay. see that the superior half of the lung field has a dominant A profile with the occasional B lines? Mm -hmm. uh, lower half of the lung field has compact B lines. And actually what is happening is that uh, in inspiration, you're getting the A profile, which is aeration. But on expiration, uh, basically what you've got is you get these B lines back, which become more dominant. So these uh, kind of, this kind of pattern is a double lung point, but you can see how there's difference between inspiration and expiration in this baby. So mm -hmm. again, this is where I would like to emphasize to you that a double lung point is not pathognomonic of TTNB alone. I'd also like to say that a double lung point can be seen in a large number of conditions where there is healing. RDS after surfactant, meconium aspiration, even pneumonias that are actually improving. And what it basically represents is a sharp demarcation between the superior and inferior lung fields. Uh, again, very nice pool sliding seen in all these areas. So with B line, so you cannot have a pneumothorax in L3. So if you look at L2, again, as Anna's very nicely described, you know, the pleura, it looks thin, a little bit sharp in the lower image, but there's this area in the middle which is completely broken down with what is a compact B line below that, uh, just uh, with interspersed A lines. So kind of lung that is partially aerated. And those are multiple double lung points. Mayank. So you've got aeration in between compact B lines. So again, a very nice image. And then when you look at L1, uh, you've got uh, this area in between which is quite dark, just at the top. Just at the top. Yeah, they're beautiful. So that is basically your rib shadow. That's a caustic shadow. So I don't want people to get confused. This is not a fractal or a shred sign. This is not broken pleura. This is just basically the rib shadow, casting a shadow. But on either side of that, what you've got is very irregular broken pleura with lots of subpleural consolidations. Again, in inspiration, you get these B lines okay. that are individual that you see going down, but in expiration, those B lines kind of merge to form one compact B line going all the way down. So you can see how there's, there's quite a bit of dynamicity. You know, it's quite dynamic how B lines can merge with each other. And we will talk about that. So that's beautiful. Uh, so uh, can we just go back to the previous slide, Anna? Yes. So again, I think what I'd like to highlight is the difference in the patterns between you know, what is, if, if you were to ask me, I think the right lung looks worse than the left lung with a dominant B profile. Yes. Uh, so let's have a look at the x-ray. Hello, can I ask a question here or maybe? For, no, no, go for it, boss. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so if you go back to, Anna, if you kindly can go back to the uh, left side, Uh, the L, yeah, uh, on the L1 images, uh, I'm not entirely sure about this shadow or the uh, casting the rib, uh, you know, um, acoustic shadowing. Of course, that's one of the factors there. Also, you can see that, you know, the ribs are, um, you're sort of, there's no separation between the ribs. Yep, so that is correct. a kind of, a, that's a, that's a kind of, a, yeah, so Mid that's image, a kind of an yeah. in indication that you might be having some component of atelectasis there because of your macronym aspiration. One of one of the indication to think about, you know, that uh, uh, that could be a, some element of atelectasis there. As you can see down below that, you can see this, you know, the broken pleuras and uh, um, uh, I'm not sure about the static bronchograms, but you can definitely see a broken uh, pleural line or a short sign there. So, um, yeah, just, just in uh, coming there. So what uh, Abhijit is describing is because you see those two ribs, they're crowding. So because of crowding, you'd suspect atelectasis. Now the pleural line is completely disappeared below that. 
I, I suspect that the dark area that you see is a caustic shadow, but just below that, if you come below that, there's this area that looks like there might be A-lines, but that probably is, is atelectasis or consolidation. So you're right. I think overall, what you can see is a very patchy appearance to the lung with multiple different areas. What was your CRP, just out of curiosity? Sorry? What was your CRP, Anna? Um, it was um, uh, 50 for your units. Sure, sure. So that's fantastic. I, I thought yeah. this, was, this was the heart shadow when I did it, this image. It could be, it could be. And uh, the only thing I'd say about the heart shadow is heart shadow should give you kind of a pulse. Yes. With a very high rate, it doesn't. My gut feeling is Abhijit's right. I think that is probably a little bit of atelectasis. Yes. Now, now I I'm looking better, and uh, because when I did the image, I thought it was uh, art. I didn't uh, realize. Yeah. So I'm going to give. Uh, uh, do you have another case, Anna? Or uh, I can present other day. It's okay. That's really kind, uh, Mayank. Yeah, because I'll need. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you happy to present? Yeah, I have one case that I'll Go just for it. Uh, yeah. share yeah. the screen. Yeah. Go for it. Is my screen visible? It is visible and audible. Okay, so I'll just go for the case. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll have to just put in this. Sorry for this. Uh, no so uh, this uh, um, baby was uh, admitted uh, in our NICU for respiratory distress soon after birth. The baby was born at 38 weeks with a birth weight of 4.2 kg. The baby was large for gestation and the baby was born through cesarean section. The mother had gestational diabetes as well. And the initial diagnosis we kept was uh, transient tachypnea of newborn. Uh, the baby was on CPAP with a... a pressure of 6 centimeters and FiO2 of 30%. Uh, the, there was mild tachypnea, but no retractions as such. Uh, this x-ray, which I'll be showing, was taken at 8 hours of life. And I did the ultrasound at 12 hours of life with a linear probe. Posterior images, uh, posterior zones were not imaged. So um, this is a little bit of underexposed film. Um, but coming to the uh, lung uh, area, uh, so uh, I feel that uh, there's not too much of fine, but I can see this uh, uh, fluid in the uh, horizontal feeser on the right side. And uh, rest of the lung fields appear almost normal to me. This thymic shadow and the heart um, uh, cardiac silhouette is appearing to be normal. So if I come to the uh, uh, ultrasound images, so this is on the left side, L1, L2, L3, and L4. So if I uh, comment on the L1 um, image, so I can see the pleura, which almost appears normal, sliding well. There's A line and there are a few comet tail artifacts. Uh, there are uh, certain uh, B lines, which are reaching uh, almost till the bottom. However, uh, I would uh, definitely classify this as A profile. Uh, coming to L2, uh, this irregular pleura on some parts of the uh, uh, Im images. Uh, and I suspect there's some subpleural cons consolidations as well uh, when uh, this uh, lung sliding with respiration. However, there are A lines and there are occasional B lines. And uh, in, uh, uh, especially on the upper part, this uh, 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 compact uh, or confluent B lines. So this more than three in a single rib space. So I would classify this as AB profile with some subpleural consolidations uh, in L2. So coming to L3, uh, I suspect that this an area, the upper part is well aerated and this uh, wet, some wetne uh, wetness which appears in the lower zones. So uh, as per my uh, uh, interpretation, I think this is a double lung point. Uh, the upper part is well aerated and there's some uh, interstitial edema or fluid in the lower parts. Uh, and if I come to the L4, uh, 
so th this uh, stomach uh, image that's also coming in but uh, the lung portion which i can see uh, is uh, well aerated there are uh, uh, multiple a lines and i would classify again this as a profile predominantly if i come to the right uh, side my, of the lung just uh, if huh. i just where's your where's your focus did you was your focus at the pleural so, line uh it, the focus is around here um, it's i have cropped the uh, video but the uh, focus is around the uh, not the pleura just around the pleura yeah so what it says that if you look at the sharpness of the pleura at l3 and l2 uh i mean again l1 it just looks very sharp at the level of l3 uh but i mean you must have had your focus at the same area uh mm -hmm. at the pleural line for these images so mm -hmm. just again what i'd say is that because we use the presence of subpleural consolidations and consolidations to help differentiate ttn from rds you know i i think the emphasis uh, from mayank is in l2 do we think these are subpleural consolidations and my only comment is if you look at l3 right in the middle so l3 in the middle at the top of the pleural line that's a comet tail and i just wonder whether when you look at l2 some of those images actually that you think might be subpleural consolidations are actually comet tails there's probably one one zone in the center where your arrow is just just your arrow was just there no middle come to the right further to the right at the top go to the top go to the top go to the pleural line please mm -hmm. go to the pleural line middle of yeah, the image Uh, so in L two, right. yeah, there. I mean, the question is: Is that a subpleural consolidation, or is that just a B line that's extending all the way down? And I think what I'd say is that this kind of concept that uh, you and TTN doesn't have consolidations at all. Actually, if the consolidations that are seen are less than point five, and the pleural line looks relatively regular, this is a blurred pleural line. uh but it's regular this is crucial it's a blurred pleural line but it's regular whereas with rds you often have an irregular pleural line so for me what is very important when i look at these four images at the moment are i've got a regular pleural line in all four images in l1 and l2 it looks blurred in l3 it's pretty sharp there's some comet tails i'm not really convinced you have massive subpleural consolidations in all four images at this particular point i think if if they are in l2 they're small and what you've got is you've got b interspersed with a profiles you definitely have dub double lung points that are visible l3 is the best place to see the double lung points l2 as well so at the moment uh, uh it'll be interesting let's see your r2 images your r images yeah so these uh, these images are from the uh, right side lung so uh, in the r1 area i can again see uh, this uh, uh, almost a, a regular uh, pleural line but uh, here i feel that this some uh, br uh, broken pleural line uh, on the uh, uh, further extreme right so uh, i'm not so sure, sure if uh, it is abnormal as such but i can see some uh, a lines and there's uh, b lines which are uh, almost erasing those a lines intermittently so i would classify this as ab profile uh, and uh, uh, coming to the r2 this is a well aerated uh, region of the lung and um, this is totally means the uh, all the areas show uh, um, discrete a lines which uh, goes down till the bottom in r3 image again i see uh, this some aerated uh, part of the lung in the upper zone and if i go down then this sub again i suspect this this is a, a broken pleura and i can see sub pleural consolidation here so uh, aerated lung in the upper zone and uh, uh, some amount of fluid in the lower part again i would classify this as a double lung point and in the r4 image i can see well aerated lung and uh, this is a complete a, a profile according to me okay so again i mean r2 and r4 look like complete a profiles total sliding you have some comet tails in r3 r2 mm -hmm. and r4 now my mm -hmm. only comment about your r3 image uh and obviously this is the right upper axilla did you have mm -hmm. your arm abducted and was your probe 90 uh, 
um probably not because there's some slanting i can see yeah. Yeah. i mean and i just wonder whether what you're seeing at the junction there that you think Mm-hmm. like a subplural consolidation with a little bit of break in plura might just be a loss of contact as you get to the superior part and that's why your plura looks quite blurred so what is very important in these situations is try to abduct the arm if you can and the baby is completely stable put the baby into the left lateral position and actually okay. get the uh, get a colleague to hold the arm upright so that you can get your probe completely at 90 and the reason for that is can you see So I what I want to show participants is as you move from right to left go to the plural line go to the plural mm-hmm. line go to extreme right now what is happening is you know that the axilla basically forms a hollow the axilla forms a hollow so because the axilla forms a hollow it is quite difficult when you go to your r3 image to really get it at 90 and the best way to do that is to try and abduct the arm and try to keep complete contact it may mean you have to slant your probe slightly because if you keep it at 90 and horizontal to the chest so can you see me can everybody see me so can you see how the axilla forms a hollow so the if if you're looking at kind of your r3 image and you're keeping your probe without abducting the the line the superior part of the probe will lose contact with the axilla so i would say try to abduct your arm to try and keep your axilla with as much contact as possible but again if i look at at least r1 r2 and r3 it is a regular plural line it's decent in r2 r4 r1 is a little bit blurred and again i just wonder whether you've lost a little bit of contact there at r1 right at the top because there's a little bit of hollowing of the chest so okay. what is the so i mean from clinically i think this fits less less well it's non homogeneous first of all with the b profile interspersed double lung points it's certainly regular plura for me in the majority at least mm. with kind of uh, maybe one or two areas of consolidation so i would feel clinically this is more in keeping with transient tachypnea uh, mm. what was the clinical course of the baby so uh, this baby was uh, tapered off uh, uh, the respiratory support after 24 hours so this was fitting clinically into ttn okay so again serial ultrasound really helps uh, in such situations mm. you follow the clinical course you do serial ultrasounds and you'll get differential aeration so very nice images beautiful i think for me what is really good is you've got good depth uh, you've got mm. three rib spaces and again uh, it's to say that ribs can appear close together so if you look at r2 again those mm-hmm. ribs appear really close together but again uh, you don't see any area of atelectasis in between so you can mm-hmm. sometimes see that kind of merged shadow as well but if, if if they are close together and you see consolidation without a plural line below that uh, mm-hmm. as i will show you today then you should think about the potential that there might be atelectasis so beautiful okay. images thank you so much thank you so i'll just stop share sure so before i start uh i'm just going to invite a few questions any questions guys hi look sorry can i ask a question just going back to my um, images So the yeah. R2, where we had preponderance of A lines all the way right to the bottom, I thought A lines don't extend all the way right down. Or oh, am I wrong? I thought no, they, 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 they can do. They can do. Uh, reason being, it depends on aeration. I mean, if your lung is completely aerated, then you okay. will have A lines all the way down. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I am just uh, going to try and share my screen. My desktop has a lot of unfortunate rubbish on it, but. So is the slide show visible and is it full screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's excellent. So guys, I won't if you go out now be able to let you in. Uh so please try to stay with me if you can. So what I'm going to do is we're going to revise a little bit of uh what was an absolutely beautiful talk by Abhijit. I I think uh, you know, one of the best talks that I've attended on lung ultrasound. I'd also like to say that uh what we are going to do is talk a little bit about nomenclature and why it's so important that we standardize what we're describing now as a first 
what I'd say to us, uh, that we have about four participants who've kind of joined us today. So just a very quick revision of the fact that with lung ultrasound, I think the initial thoughts were that we could not use it. And the reason being, everybody used to kind of think that, well, actually you have air and air basically has uh, an acoustic impedance that doesn't let ultrasound waves penetrate at all. So if they can't penetrate, actually, you're not going to be able to see anything uh, beneath the level of tissue. Now, that's quite important because actually the kind of concept that we have is that whenever we use ultrasound, ultrasound basically uh, has waves which go into tissue and actually describe anatomy. But actually the fact is that uh, ultrasound interacts with these tissues in different ways and produces artifact uh, reacting with the, the tissue outside, the pleura at the margin and the lung. And it's this artifact that we're using to basically interpret exactly what the lung looks like. And as you can see over just two weeks, I mean, of all of our colleagues who have presented, I mean, some of them have never done lung ultrasound before, but you can see how just uh, in two weeks, the learning curve, and for those of you who attended my first lecture, I said to you that, uh, you know, the learning curve for lung ultrasound is very quick as compared to cranial ultrasound, as compared to echocardiography, your ability to describe what you can see is absolutely crucial. And I would argue that for all ultrasound, uh, for all echocardiography and for brain ultrasound, the concept is you describe exactly what you can see. And once you describe what you can see, you then make an interpretation of that description to give you what you think based on clinical correlation that might represent. And you write that clinical impression into a conclusion, which may then alter your management or not alter your management. But in lung ultrasound in particular, what we're doing is we're not just looking at the anatomy of the skin, the tissue below that, the ribs, uh, you know, intercostal space in between. We're actually looking at artifact below, which is helping us define uh, the difference between aeration and fluid in the lung. And uh, I'm just going to use my cursor here. So basically, if that's the lung tissue, what you can see is these, uh, these uh, kind of uh, bronchi going into smaller bronchioles, which then meet alveoli. But in between them, there is interstitial space. And this interstitial space, when you're born, is full of fluid. There are interlobular septa, which connect these areas. And clearly, depending on the aeration and the alveolar kind of expansion, the fluid will be less in the interlobular spaces and get gradually absorbed. So really, it's the difference between the ratio of air and fluid in the lung, which is then giving us a definition of the lung in the form of artifact. Now, how do we list this artifact? And there is a whole alphabet that's been described as part of a standardized nomenclature, which has been described by uh, international guidelines, most recently uh, revised in 2020, which help us define this nomenclature. And uh, if you look at Daniel Lichtenstein's work, then actually they define this nomenclature right down from A to Z. In particular, what is important is that we know the common things. And for me, I think for all practical purposes, what I would like you to kind of get a little bit of an idea about is I definitely want you to be able to define A lines, B lines, and in particular, the B line progression with a good deal of accuracy. I'm not worried about B line mimics like E and Z lines and C lines. I think, you know, if that's something that's visible to you, that's, that's absolutely great. But actually from my perspective, stick to the basics, try to keep it as simple as possible. So when you look at the lung structure, so again, what you've got is skin, you've got ribs, you've got the intercostal space in between, which is a combination of subcutaneous tissue, muscle. Uh, and then what you've basically got is pleura. And you've got the pleural line, which is basically uh, the, the, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, as you can see here in green. And below that, what you've got is aerated lung in the form of alveoli. Uh, but in between, you've got these areas of interstitial space, which are full of interlobular septa, uh, kind of which, which take interstitial fluid. Now, when you look at lung ultrasound, the waves will come in, they'll penetrate and they'll hit the rib shadows and they'll reflect back. And because ribs being bone have a very, very high uh, density, the reflection will be massive. So basically what you'll get is a caustic shadowing in between. But actually the intercostal spaces will help the sound waves penetrate. Your probe will be at this margin. Now there's a big 
acoustic impedance between air and skin. So in order to reduce this acoustic impedance, we use gel, which basically helps with better penetration of the sound waves. And what we really want to do uh, from a protocol perspective is we want to try and get three ribs and two intercostal spaces where possible. Now with a linear probe, that's easier done. But actually when you're using the hockey stick, which has a very small footprint, it might be that you can only get this area here. And it might mean that you have to take multiple images to actually get your R1, R2, and R3 images. Now, just if we, we define what we are going to do now is we're going to revise artifact a little bit, but what we're really going to do is we're going to try and look and translate that into a standardized nomenclature that I would expect you to use going forwards so that we can actually describe things in a standard way. And why is this important? This is very important because what we've seen is that with the use of different terminologies uh, in lung ultrasound, there are differences in how we then interpret what uh, we might see. And there's, there can be quite significant inter-observer variation. Now, actually for conditions like RDS and TTN and pneumothorax, there is very little inter-observer variation. But clearly, if you look at terminology, comet tails are also called rockets. Uh, if you look at how adults describe beelines, there are glass rockets, there are, uh, uh, and I think what happens is there's a lot of confusion that then comes into our mind as to how we should be describing this pattern. Now for reporting purposes, what I'd say is what is important is that you're all using the same terminology to report them. Because clearly if somebody then has to review your reports, especially from outside the Institute, it becomes very confusing of them to kind of get an idea of what you're actually giving as descriptive terminology. This is internationally endorsed. But where possible, you standardize the terminology that you use for description in your unit. And I'm not saying that what I'm describing over here in this talk is the standard terminology in itself. I'm going to give you an evidence-based approach to it, which is described in the international guidelines and consensus on use of lung ultrasound. But clearly you might decide based on your own expertise, which you will have over years, uh, that actually you might want to describe a particular kind of nomenclature that you use in your unit. What I'd say is that if you're doing that, please stick to it. But more importantly, let's, let's all kind of acknowledge that lung ultrasound is, uh, I would say, 10 years into its inception. And there is a huge amount of variation in the articles over the last 10 years in how they describe the different kinds of terminology that are used, including A and B lines and the types of B lines. So uh, we're now coming to kind of uh, doing groundwork, which is described very nicely uh, in uh, this particular statement uh, by Yasser al Said and his group in the crashing neonate. And in particular, in situations where you have a crashing neonate, what is very important is that you are describing, giving descriptions that fit a standardized terminology, because this is quite a critical situation. So again, what I'd say is you have to develop a consensus about what terminology you use to describe artifacts and signs in lung ultrasound in your unit. And there are standard international guidelines, which I will be sending to you this week. Just in terms of uh, terminology, so just giving you a little bit of an idea about A-lines. So A-lines are basically formed and have artifact generation based on ultrasound waves. Uh, that come and hit the skin, pass through the intercostal spaces and interact with the pleural line. So if you have well aerated lung with very little interstitial kind of fluid, the ultrasound waves will interact with the pleural line. And what they will do is they will reflect the pleural line. But as they go in, you have alveolar tissue where they basically get trapped in between in the intercostal spaces and reflect against each other. And these multiple reflections create what we call our reverberations in the tissue, which create what are horizontal reverberation artifacts. These are classically defined as A lines. Now, there used to be this concept that if you have B lines, B lines will erase A lines. And this was classically why I'm saying that terminology and kind of interpretation of A lines and B lines has changed over 10 years because we definitely know in neonates that A lines and B lines can coexist as you've seen in the images that were shown by Doris, Mayank and Anna today. So clearly what you can have is you can have transitional states where A lines exist with B lines. And in particular, what you can see is transition from what are 
dominant B lines where fluid is gradually getting absorbed to A lines. So kind of profiles in between that we classically describe as AB profile. Or you can have one lung which shows a dominant A profile and the other lung which shows uh, a B profile, which is classically described by Daniel Lichtenstein as uh, an A slash B profile. And that is, he's classically described that in the blue protocol as reflecting pneumonia. On the other hand, you might find that actually there are no B lines and you can only see A lines with no pleural sliding because the parietal and the visceral pleura are actually uh, separated by air. So what you're basically seeing is uh, the parietal pleura and sound waves going in with a lack of attenuation so that you get horizontal reverberation artifacts again uh, in the collapsed uh, area of the lung being distal to that. So you get this classical kind of A dash profile or A prime profile as it's described. So what, what I'd like to allude to is that you really need to make sure that you can describe these in a standardized way. So classical A lines, as you can see, so the plural line, and what you can see is this attenuation here. So you've got a rib with a rib shadow, as you can see, and this plural line being incredibly sharp with uh, the ultrasound waves basically reflecting within each other to kind of create these horizontal kind of reverberation artifacts. But as I've told you in ultrasound physics, here what is happening is you are having attenuation so that the A lines become less dense. And coming back to Doris's questions, if you have well aerated lung, then actually A lines can appear right down to the base as you can see on the right hand side over here. So again, a plural line. Now it's just the difference between using what is a sector probe from using a probe, which is basically, uh, again, a sector probe, but with a very small footprint. So if you use, say, uh, the cranial ultrasound probe, which kind of uh, gives is a phase array kind of a probe, you'll get this wide margin here, but you'll get a very small plural line uh, because of the footprint being small. But as the ultrasound waves diverge, what you can see is the central areas, because these waves are more concentrated, reflect back better, give you a sharper margin, uh, as compared to the, the peripheral areas. And actually, as you go in, you have attenuation. So these A waves go on actually decreasing. Uh, the fact is that actually from your perspective, in some cases, you might find that you get beautiful A waves. And again, this is probably because of the probe that you're using and the frequency. So again, just to highlight that uh, you may end up describing these two images in two different ways, but actually they reflect exactly the same appearance of the lung field in that region. This is a normal lung field with an A profile. There is plural sliding seen over here. And just take my word for it, there would have been plural sliding seen over there. Now, again, just another example of plural sliding with an A profile. And classically, when you have plural sliding with an A profile, what you can see is a, a, a dominant profile, which indicates that this lung is well aerated. If you don't have attenuation, as you can see here, and this is because they're using a linear probe here, which is basically being used with a low frequency. So you have very good lung depth penetration. So again, you have A lines that are visible for quite a margin. And the classical description on M mode for this pattern is what is classically described as a seashore sign. So really what you're kind of seeing is uh, uh, waves at the top with kind of the beach and sand at the bottom. So it's also called as the seashore sign or the, 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 the sandy beach sign. So this is what I would classically say is aerated normal lung and you can see plural sliding over here. What is important is that you are able to see lung sliding because lung sliding is the marker of normal lung. What it indicates is that the baby is breathing and the pleura is moving with inspiration and expiration. And the reason lung sliding occurs physiologically is because parietal pleura moves over visceral pleura. Now, if you have a pneumothorax, you'll have air between the parietal and visceral pleura, which means you cannot see lung sliding because the pleural margin is separated. But again, what you can see here is you can see sliding. Now, I'm just curious, anybody want to have a go? Uh, what do we think about the image on the left? So let's ask, uh, who should we put on the spot? Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So uh, where do you think plural sliding is poor? The, the image on the left or the image on the right? 
on the left side sir is there proper Matlab sliding my, on my my left side that is where yeah. the a lines uh, it is uh, written so this image yeah. where i have my marker so yes. is there yes, proper sliding or no proper sliding plural sliding it's poor sir because on the right side the so plural sliding what do we think guys better. let's ask the audience i want your opinion so the image where the cursor is is there plural sliding or is there no plural sliding there is plural sliding okay lela thinks there's plural sliding fantastic anybody say there's no plural sliding Okay, we got a few. Mayank says this sliding. Is it the image on the left? Okay, where the cursor is. That's correct. Compared to the right, the plural sliding on the on the left is poor. I don't but know. is there sliding or no sliding? I think there's no sliding. Three months, three months no sliding. There's no sliding compared to the right. Okay, so can I just say, can you see my cursor? Mm. Would you all agree there's sliding there? Can you see how it moves? Yes, there's some movement. Yeah. Okay. Would you yes, also sir. agree there's sliding here? Can you see how it moves? Yes. yes. So the real question is: Is there sliding over here or not? Correct. Now, how do I know there's sliding? Can you see this area here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you see how it moves? Can you see how they all move? Mm -hmm. Can you see how they all move? But, so yes. you have these lines here. So there is sliding in the middle as well, but it's poor. Okay. Now I would. i would say to you if you're confused can you get this baby to cry because if you can get this baby to cry a little bit your sliding will become more apparent but the other thing that you can do in this situation is just take your probe off and bring your probe back on again and you might find that you accentuate sliding so there are ways to kind of make sliding a little bit more prominent if you're confused and one of them is trying to get the baby to slide but standardized terminology when you're describing your descriptive terminology of the lung in your clinical approach first is the pleura what it looks like it's regular it's linear it's continuous and there is sliding in all four regions these are five things that you must always describe about the pleura and then you are moving to your a and b line pattern that would be standardized description as per international lung guidance okay what about b lines so b lines were described by a very esteemed colleague uh, dr ziskin and his colleagues in 1982 and really there has been a lot of controversy about whether we should regard b lines and comet tail artifacts as the same thing if you look at the initial literature about a decade back there was quite a bit of uh, kind of uh, overlap and a lot of the authors who actually kind of uh, describe bee lines describe comet tail artifacts synonymously they also describe bee lines and comet tail artifacts and comet tail artifacts are called rockets and uh, some people like to call bee line artifacts as glass rockets or septal rockets if they originate from or don't originate from the plural lines so there was there was quite a bit of kind of difference in the way we kind of describe them but clearly the standardized definition for a b line is that it is a vertical laser like hyperechoic artifact that it always arises from the plural line i cannot emphasize this enough uh it will always go through the edge of the screen to the bottom and it should not fade the other thing is it will move with lung sliding and respiratory movements so again if you look at standardized terminology and the reason i i i have i'm having great emphasis on this is let's say you're having an argument with your colleague about whether these are b lines or kind of uh, whether these are comet tail artifacts or these are b line mimics as i will subsequently explain then really what you should have is the origin from the plural line them coming right down to the bottom and them having lung sliding three characteristics if they don't come right down to the bottom but originate from the plural line they may well be uh, comet tails uh, on the other hand if they don't slide with the lung uh, then they might be what we classically call as e lines so i think what is important is that you you try to look at these uh, artifacts and describe them using these kind of characteristics to support your diagnosis 
what are they generated by? So they are generated mainly by the presence of fluid in the interstitial space, inter and intralobular septa in between the alveoli. And the reason for this is, as I've previously told you, uh, we have tetrahedrons of bubbles, which basically from our perspective, uh, tend to cause ultrasound waves to get trapped in between and create what we call our vertical artifacts. Now, these vertical artifacts, as you can see, so your ultrasound waves will come from here. These are the alveoli and this is the interstitial space, which is full of fluid. So the interaction that they'd normally have with A-lines is completely disrupted because of this fluid and that sound waves, which would normally go get reflected back vertically, get reflected back vertically, actually from our perspective, get reflected back in a way that causes problems with, I would say, the sound waves reflecting in between. And this causes horizontal artifacts, which then from our perspective, we call beeline artifacts. Now, as we get more fluid in the lungs, as you can see in this particular situation, you will find that the artifacts, the beelines basically merge together and they form compact beelines. And eventually what you get is if you get fluid in the alveoli and fluid everywhere, you get this kind of white lung or white out appearance. So basically, these B lines merge, and as interstitial fluid increases, you get alveolar interstitial syndrome, and then you classically get a B line pattern. And this is classically what they look like. So, if you have simple B lines, which are there because you have less interstitial fluid, these sound waves reflecting uh, and getting trapped within each other basically create this vertical reverberation artifact. And these are seen quite clearly. So, if you look at B lines, originate from the plural line, go right down to the bottom are continuous. And as I'll show you in a subsequent video, they move with the pleura. Now, clearly what you can see over here is this is a very large comet tail, but comet tails have these kind of horizontal kind of appearance because the tetrahedrons cause reflection amongst the parallel surfaces within each other, which get trapped. This is a very big comet tail. This is a B line. This is a B line. These are all B lines that you can see attending. And then what happens is these B lines can merge. And this is classically what you call a coalescent B line. Again, reflecting the fact that you have more interstitial fluid in this particular area. But if this were to merge together into one column, you would then have what we call is a compact B line. So again, classically what you can see over here is brutal sliding. And you've got this A line. And again, just to give you a flavor of the fact Act to say B lines always obliterate A lines. So if you have a B appearance, you won't see A lines. That's that's very old school. Actually, what you lines coexisting with B lines, and it just reflects the difference between aeration. And this is decently aerated lung, with areas where you can see B all the way to the bottom. Uh, you can see coalescent B lines. I'd call them compact at this particular point. The multiple B lines like like intercostal space over here. There are at least more than three B lines in this intercostal space. But uh, actually, over here, you can see a dominant B, coalescent B lines, but they slide. And if you just come and look over here, we subtural kind of uh, consolidations. So this is actually, let's say, an RDS appearance after surfactant. So, and just how you describe this is very important. Now, as interstitial fluid goes on increasing, what you find is these B lines become increased in number. And if you look at old terminology based on old studies, in particular adult studies, B lines that coalesce together, this one B line were, were called septal rockets. And if they actually looked a little bit transparent or glass-like, we call them glass rockets. Now, the reason we don't use these terminologies anymore is because the newer machines tend to reduce artifact. So the older machines, uh, unfortunately, had filters which weren't able to reduce artifacts. So they would give you these beautiful images. And based on that old kind of uh, nomenclature, you had these descriptions. We've kind of, I'd say, most of the authors uh, that I've been taught by have kind of stopped using these terminologies because newer machines tend to reduce the artifact and try to stick to describing the lung in the form of A, B lines, the lung profile, brutal sliding, 
And then if B lines kind of progress, as you can see over here, so this is a pure A profile with the plural line. If they were sliding, this would be normal. You then have what is a B profile with a lot of D lines here, individual. And then this is basically a coalesce B line that you see over here. But if the interstitial fluid goes up even further, then what you classically get is this complete white out appearance because the alveoli are also full of fluid, which we call white lung. Now, by definition, Jing Lu basically says that you should be able to differentiate white lung and AIS. So if this was just one zone, this would be AIS. But if you have AIS in every lung zone, we call it a white lung appearance. So again, you've got these uh, lines that are merged over here. Now, these are basically what you call compact D lines. They've merged to the point where they go all the way to the bottom. Now, if you move across, you find that these compact B lines are fusing together and you're getting what is classically an AIS pattern over here, still with individual B lines here, but this is AIS, but because it's not seen in every lung field, we don't call it a whiteout. And then if you go to this lung field over here, basically you see everything together. And this is called classical whiteout appearance, but for a classical whiteout appearance, you should see this in every lung field. Again, uh, you can see uh, what is, a white out appearance, AIS, if this is one lung field, but these are compact B lines. And again, these are compact B lines, but you see subplural consolidations. Now, if I just differentiate B and C over here, you have a very regular plural line. You have no subplural consolidations, but here you have lots of subplural consolidations. So this clinical picture would be RDS, and this would fit more with TTN. So the regularity of the plural line in this particular situation and the absence of subplural and consolidations is something that helps you differentiate transient tachypnea of newborn from RDS. But can you see how they can both give you a white out appearance and why it's so important that you use standardized terminology? So how am I describing the plura? I'm looking to see if it's regular. I'm looking to see if uh, it there is sliding, that it has continuity, that it does not have breaks. Whereas over here, it looks to me like it's irregular. There are breaks in the plura and there are classical subplural consolidations. And if you look at D, actually it's even worse. So the difference here is these are all longitudinal scans, but this is uh, basically a transverse scan in one rib space. And what you've got is basically the rib and a very broken down margin with quite significant uh, subplural uh, kind of consolidations and areas of breakdown, which basically reflect fractal or shred sign. But again, this classically, these are compact B lines. Now this is mnemonic consolidation at the top and these are compact B lines. So again, it's a white out appearance at the bottom, but can you see how there's a difference in how we're doing this and describing it? And it gets even more marked here. And this is classically a very nice shred sign here. This is a- Is there any fluid in uh, so like a plural uh, effusion? Yeah, in just D in this- uh, And E, both. So E definitely, I would say there is. And I think what I would do here is I would go back to trying to do what is a transverse image as opposed to a longitudinal image. I'm not really convinced you've got fluid here, but what you really need to see is see it in dynamic view with lung sliding. There's definitely a plural effusion that you can see in either. It's that dark margin there. Okay. Sir. It's different patterns of white out lung appearance. And again, so let's, let's have a little bit of an exercise here. So, uh, let us see who is Dr. Vetreville. So I'm just looking at uh, the image on the left. So would you like to describe the plura, please? Uh, Dr. Vetrevel, can you hear me? Maybe not. My apologies. So, uh, Dr. Look, can I, yeah. can I cry? Yes, please. Go for it, Dr. Latif. Yeah, thank you. This uh, on the left side image. Where yeah, you just are, where you see the cursor. Yeah. yeah. Describe yeah, the so plural. This uh, plural look regular and uh, regular and thin. And uh, I can see the B lines some compact B lines also and the rib shadows. And uh, there is lighting also. 
Okay, beautiful. So three things in the description of the plura. Regular. Yeah, continuous. Con continuous yeah. and? And the uh, 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 sliding. Beautiful. So those three things are very important. And then classically what you can see. So what the adults would say is that these are classically what you they describe as glass uh, kind of, uh, sorry, septal rockets, not glass rockets. Now, we are not going to use that terminology. What we're going to do is we're going to describe these B lines. And clearly these are B lines. They extend all the way to the bottom, right to the bottom of the screen. Uh, there are some B lines over here, which are not extending to the bottom. And this is basically because you're using uh, a phase array sector probe. So actually, I think if you'd used a linear probe, you'd be able to see this B line extend all the way to the bottom of the screen. And what you're having is basically attenuation because the ultrasound waves are maximally concentrated. And this is why I would say using a hockey stick or a linear probe is better. And the reason I'm showing you the slide is because you can easily see that if you used a linear probe or a hockey stick, I mean, here it's quite clear this is a B profile, but using a phase array probe, you might miss these B lines and you might see just one or two B lines and actually think this is an A dominant profile, whereas it's wet. So that's how the difference in probes can actually alter the ultrasound appearances. So what we're now going to do is uh, I'm gonna get uh, Dr. Hamad. Uh, Shema, can you hear me? Okay, Subhash, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is that Shema? No. Uh, who, is that Subhash? <laughs> no, I'm Vaz. Anna. Okay. Uh, Anna, <laughs> I, do I me a favor. Beds. Yeah. Okay. How would you describe the image on the right? Well, I think the we have a, a beautiful line with sliding. A lines. Yep. And some B lines also. It's a linear probe. Yep. And the rib shadow here. Beautiful. So I think what I'm highlighting over here is how would you describe those B lines? Are they isolated, single? Are they confluent or would you say they're compact? Uh, I think isolated. Okay. So probably the ones in the middle. But what about this area here? How would yes, you describe? More compact, yes. Yeah, more compact. So what you're seeing is progression. Now, what I'd like to say to you is that if you read the literature and see various images, you might find authors causing, calling these B lines as confluent B lines as opposed to compact B lines. Please don't get too hung up on the, the terminology. I think if you call these compact B lines, I'd have absolutely no problem with it. Uh, on the other hand, if you said confluent B lines, I would have no problems with it. And there are various definitions and somebody basically says you have to have more than three B lines merged together to call it a, a kind of a compact B line. Just try not to get too hung up on that. Describe the pattern that you can see, you will be right. But clearly what you can see here is just increasing B profile where you can see compact B lines that are gradually merging together versus a white lung where basically you've got a compact B line at that margin, but basically everything's merged together. So you can see as alveolar interstitial kind of syndrome progresses, you end up with this white lung appearance, but for definition of white lung appearance, you should see this in every lung field. Now, what is the difference between uh, a B line and a comet tail artifact? So a comet tail artifact classically takes its origin from the plural line but it will not go all the way to the bottom and it will gradually fade. And really what it is, is a collection of horizontal kind of uh, reverberations, which create a vertical appearance because you've got sound waves which are trapped between two highly reflective surfaces. So these are classical comet tails. So again, the pathophysiology of the ultrasound is same. You've got these tetrahedrons through which sound waves are actually getting reflected back. But the difference between a beeline, which will extend all the way to the margin is, there will be gradual attenuation of these. So as they go down, can you see how the sound waves go decreasing in number to the point where they then disappear towards the bottom? So actually because of this attenuation effect, you get what is classically called a comet tail physiology. These aren't beelines, please. 
unlike what is described. So again, very nice kind of an image where you see plural sliding and you can see these small comet tails. They will also move with the plura, but they will not go all the way down and they are not beelines. And they should not be considered as a marker of interstitial edema or pulmonary edema. Now, in today's uh, kind of uh, images that were shown, you saw Doris show a very nice image of what is classically defined as a sea line. So a sea line is basically an area of subplural hypoechogenicity, which is basically generated by tissue that has come away. So basically you have the parietal and the vessel plura, which have kind of moved away from each other. And because of this, you've got authors which, and in particular Daniel Lichtenstein, who describes this as a, a sea line. They're not true lines. They are basically an area of the lung that's fallen away so that the visceral pleura has, has, has come away from the parietal pleura. Now, the clinical correlate for us in, in neonates is what we call is the fractal sign or the thread sign. And in that, what happens is this pleural margin becomes very irregular with a lot of hypo, hypoechogenicity, whereas uh, the, the, the margin above may be irregular or destroyed. And that is classically called fractal or thread sign. But that's, this is just for terminology. Don't get too hung up on it. And I would frankly ask you to forget about this, but I'm, I'm just for completion's sake telling you what B-line mimics are. So there are E-lines, and E-lines basically reflect the presence of air above the plural line, as in subcutaneous emphysema. So actually, this is the plural line in this baby. And really what has happened is that you've got uh, air that is leaked into the tissue at the top. Now, we know that you're going to have an air tissue interface with high impedance acoustic impedance, which will cause reflection. So it gives you these kind of bright areas with some vertical kind of uh, uh, artifacts, which can mimic B lines. Uh, they are classically called E lines. The most important thing is because they don't take their origin from the plural line, which is kind of not seen. And the reason you can't see plural line over here is because if you remember what I said, you have air. So if you have air here, it's going to reflect everything back. Now, if it's going to reflect everything back, you're not going to see plural line below it. Some people can get confused that's plural line, it's not. Actually, these are E-lines and they, as you see, you will not see them sliding uh, this line, but you will also see these lines not going to the bottom and not sliding. So what they will, however, do is because you have air that's reflecting everything back and this is not plura, you're not going to see A-lines below that. Whereas here you can see a small A-line. So again, this is what E-lines look like. They're B-line mimics. And then you have what are called Z lines, forget about them as well, but basically they are vertical bundle like uh, artifacts that arise from the plural line. They're indefined and they do not erase A lines. So classically what you can see over here. So they're called Z lines. I would say just forget about them. This is a really nice uh, kind of a, uh, a vector, which basically shows the different kind of lines. And as we described, when you have air in the interface, so E lines will always be above the level of the pleura. They will not move because obviously they aren't linked to pleura. And often the pleura below them will actually appear completely absent because you've got subcutaneous emphysema. On the other hand, a B line basically, because it's a vertical reverberation artifact, will extend from the pleural margin right to the bottom. It will move with the pleura. And for all practical purposes, it can merge, get thicker, form a compact B line or a coalescent B line. If multiple B lines merge together, they eventually basically form compact B lines. Compact B lines coming together form AIS. And if you see AIS everywhere, with it's called a white lung appearance. And then you've basically got A lines, which are horizontal artifacts. And then we've got what we call our Z lines. So for all practical purposes, don't worry too much about E and Z lines. We've discussed the normal lung and what it looks like. And classically, what you're trying to do when you put your probe on is being at 90 degrees, you want to see the ribs with the intercostal space in between, a bright pleural margin. So this appearance is basically described as the batwing appearance. Now, what is important is you get shadow artifact behind the ribs, but really the ribs act as a strong reflector. And in particular, when you get a strong reflector, you're going to get a dark area behind the ribs with this appearance of the pleura in between. And this is classically what we describe as the batwing margin. 
But normal lung on M mode will give you, and this is the, the next standardized terminology that I'd, I'd like you to think about, is what you describe on M mode. Now, this is really important. So if you have good pleural sliding, uh, you have no air between the parietal and visceral pleura. You'll have the rib margins, which basically give you this acoustic uh, kind of shadow at the back, and the pleura will move. Now, because the pleura moves, the superficial layers of this area give you this classical artifact. But the pleural margin below gives you a kind of a uniform appearance of what looks like sand. So you've got waves here, you've got the shore, and you've got sand. And this is classically described as the seashore sign or the sandy beach sign. And this is a sign of normal lung. So again, sliding in this situation, but sliding in this slide on the right basically is clearly visible. It's not visible on the left. And you might think that there's no sliding on the left or is there a little bit of sliding? So what you can do is you can put M mode over here as I'll describe. And what you'll see on, in this area is basically a classical seashore sign. But in this area, what you'll see is a barcode sign. So again, very important that you use standardized terminology to kind of describe that. And I would say stick to one thing in your department. Lots of people get confused between the seashore and the sandy beach and the barcode sign and the stratosphere sign. Just stick to one terminology, whatever you like for everybody. So I'm going to finish this talk now by going to the next step. And the next step is what we call our lung profiles. Now, we've talked a lot, and a lot of people are already using this terminology. But what are lung profiles? So lung profiles are basically terminology that have been established by Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein in his article to describe the Blue Protocol. And what he basically said is that whilst we have an alphabetical series to describe A, B, C, E, Z lines, what you can also do is you can describe a whole lung profile alphabetically as well. And in particular, if you have sliding with them, then we classically call the A kind of lines that we see with the back wing appearance in A profile. Uh, on the other hand, if you have B lines what, what with lung sliding, you'd call it a B profile. If you have consolidation or mnemonic kind of consolidation, we call it a C profile. I will talk about the AB later, but if there's absent lung sliding, then these are classically what we call A dash and B dash profiles. And A dash is a classical, the classical example is pneumothorac. But with a B dash profile, there are a variety of different conditions. So pneumonia can give you a B profile because you can have sliding, but pneumonia can also give you a B dash profile. And actually, if you have complete atelectasis, you're not going to see the pleural margin, but you will see lung that looks very tissue like, again, which is called a B dash profile. So he's described them into these profiles. And the reason he's done that is because you can use each individual profile to then think about what possible pathology you have and what you're dealing with. And this is applicable to neonates as well. What is very important from your perspective is that, again, you try to standardize this because a B profile has a large spectrum. So if you have a B profile, it can vary from white lung, AIS, compact B lines to just more than three B lines per intercostal space. Whereas an A profile, again, you can have, you can have B lines with an A profile but there will be less than three B lines per intercostal space. So just remember, an A profile is an A dominant profile where you have pleural sliding with horizontal reverberation artifacts. But if you had the odd B line in it, which you can actually have until a child is three years of age, uh, that's, that's an A profile. On the other hand, once you progress to more than three B lines per intercostal space, region of the lung scene, then by definition, you're really saying that's a B profile. And that B profile can then progress onto coalescent B lines, to compact B lines, to an AIS-like pattern to white lung. Now, if that B profile technically is associated with a large area of subpleural or deep consolidation as seen by an area of lung distal to the pleura, now that could be a mnemonic consolidation, it could be a consolidation because you've got lack of aeration of that side of the lung, it could be a collapse or an atelectasis, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Then really what we're calling is, we're calling that a C profile. Uh, 
again, just an example of A versus B profile. So we're just looking at the progress at this particular point. So these are A lines. There is sliding, take my word for it. But you see A profile, no B lines. So this is well aerated lung. On the other hand, over here, when you look again, you see a prural margin. This is obviously a phase array probe with A lines. So this is an A profile. Now, suddenly over here, you've got A and B lines which coexist. But if you look at this intercostal space, I can probably only see one B line that actually goes to the bottom. This stops here. This is probably comet tail. So actually, if I just look at this intercostal space, there may be two B lines I can see. They're not three. So they're less than three B lines per intercostal space. So while you can see B lines here, this is still an A profile. It's well aerated lung. And actually, if you were to get this baby to cry, uh, then really what you might see is these B lines disappear completely. On the other hand, when you come to this region here, what you can see is very closely spaced ribs. And you've got easily more than three B lines. Some of them merge together. So this is a B profile. And you can see how an A can go to a B profile. But more importantly, in a baby who basically is transitioning, who's born with a lot of fluid, what you will gradually see is a profile like this going to uh, a profile of A lines. But then you have a profile in between, which is A dominant with B lines. Now, there is no terminology for this, but for all practical purposes, I would ask you to think about using an AB or a BA profile. And if you are technically A dominant, it's AB profile. But if you're B dominant, it's a B profile. So AB profile for me is reflection of transitioning lung. Or if you have a double lung point, again, you might have a B profile on one side with an A profile on the other side. And again, some people like to call that an AB profile. So this is just how you progress. So less than three lines per intercostal space, so an A profile, more than three B lines per intercostal space. So technically, uh, what I would say is a B profile, compact B lines, classical B profile. Now, these are clearly B lines that you can see, no A lines, so completely obliterated. So again, a B profile. And here you can see basically complete coalescence. So what I would say is a white lung kind of appearance. This is AIS. If you saw this in all lung fields, then clearly what you'd see, you'd call this uh, a white lung profile. And this is just another form of the white lung profile. Here you have subplural consolidations. Here you don't. You can see a lung pulse over here. So this is an A profile, but these are just different degrees of B profiles progressing as interstitial fluid is going up. I've talked about the AV profile. I'm not going to repeat it. It's not something that Daniel Lichtenstein's kind of uses in his terminology, but it's something that I would encourage you to use. And then what you can classically see here, see here is a C profile. So this is a transfer scan, one rib space that you can see over here uh, with the plural margin. Now here you see plura with subplural consolidation. You have a small fractal or shred sign, but here you have a massive shred sign. The, the plura is completely destroyed. Uh, you can see some, uh, I would say, subplural kind of, uh, I would call them static air bronchograms at this particular point, but with completely destroyed plura. So this is consolidated lung, uh, probably a pneumonia because you've got severe shred sign. On the other hand, if you look at this area over here, you can see plura, very nice plural margin. Uh, this is an A profile. You know, you have no B lines which are touching the margin. And then you come to this area of the lung where you see what is called, this is a double lung point. You see uh, classically what looks like a B profile. This is basically a compact B line that's gone right to the bottom. But if we go to the top of this lung field, what you can see is static air bronchograms uh, along with complete absence of the pleura over here. Uh, so there's air that is not reaching the margin. And this is actually, this is atelectasis for you. But this is also a B profile with a, sorry, a, a apologies, a C profile. So you can see coexistence of an A, a B, and a C profile together. What is an A prime or an A dash profile? So classically seen with a pneumothorax. So you can see ribs here. There's no plural sliding. You can see mirror image artifact, parallel A lines. And if you put uh, M mode, you see uh, a classical, what is called a barcode sign. The reason you see a barcode sign is because the tissue underneath would give you a normal seashore sign if there was no air and the visceral and parietal pleura were sliding over each other. 
because waves would be able to penetrate through. Here, the problem is you have huge amounts of reflection from the parietal pleura. So in essence, what you've got is uh, absence of sliding and movement of tissue throughout. And basically, this entire area that looks like the waves is duplicated throughout as a barcode. So again, just the difference between normal lung and a pneumothorax. So the seashore sign, as you can see, so waves, this is kind of the beach and this is the sand. So clearly seashore sign, but if you have no sliding, basically what you've got is this entire pattern, which is distributed because you have no lung motion. Uh, so this is classically called the barcode of the stratosphere sign. And this is how it looks. So again, this is an area of a pneumothorax. There's no pleural sliding over here. You have A lines beneath, and this is a classical barcode sign. When you're looking at a pneumothorax, what you're trying to do is you're trying to trace the area of the normal lung and the lung point. So clearly what you can see over here is a B profile. There's irregular pleura. This is a baby who's basically got respiratory distress. There's some subpleural consolidations there with the regular pleura, and the baby's developed a pneumothorax. There's no lung sliding here. There's parallel uh, kind of A lines and this is the lung point. And what you classically see when you put M mode on is alternate sandy beach with barcode, alternate sandy beach with barcode sign. And this is what you want to see when you're looking at the double, the, the lung point, uh, not the double lung point. So can I ask, uh, so Mayank, we're nearly done, but uh, let's give you a little bit of homework. So Mayank, can you hear me? Okay, uh, Dr. Figurado, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, okay. so can I ask you to describe uh, the image on the left? On the left, so... Uh, okay, so we have the... The pleural line uh, sharp, I think. Very good. All and throughout? The, All throughout? Is it, it sharp here? I don't know for sure if there is some, yeah, in in, in that space, if, but, but I think. Okay, I would go with is, your opinion completely. Yeah, there is a long sliding also. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, uh, in the in the left part of the image, uh, we can see some subpleural consolidation or some epiracogenic uh, findings there. I don't know. Okay, beautiful. So, are you happy? There's lung sliding over here. Can you see those lines move? Yeah, yeah. So the, B the, the, the B lines. The B lines, no comet tail is pro probably. Yep. So Some those are comet time. tails. Yeah. My gut mm -hmm. feeling is this would probably have been a beeline if I was a little bit more 90. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about this this margin here? Moving? I don't know. For sure. <laughs> Anybody want to have a guess? Probably not. It's, it's, it's not sliding very well in front in the left side. So is it moving side to side or up and down? Up and down. Yeah. Up and down. Okay. Yes. So when it moves up and down, what do we call that? Lung pulse. Beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. That's amazing. So you've got lung pulse there. Do you have any B, B lines kind of, or is this kind of a, do you have any A lines? No. Nope. Okay. So what you've got is you've got a plural margin that's fairly well defined. You've got these kind of static air bronchograms, the dots that you see mm -hmm. with an area of consolidation. Okay. okay. So, I mean, theoretically, this is a consolidation for you. Now, if you had fractal sign or broken pleura with kind of uh, areas of subpleural kind of uh, atelectasis, that could be a mnemonic consolidation if your mm -hmm. CRP was elevated. But what I'd say is that for the mnemonic consolidation, you should theoretically be able to see the pleural line. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you want to have a go at trying to describe the image on the right? Uh, in the right, so we can see the plural line at the right part of the yeah the picture. But then at the left, 
we don't see it in the, in the same level. Okay, so what is that there? This is the consolidation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, theoretically they're both consolidations, but the question is which yeah. of these is atelectasis or collapse? Okay, we can see. Probably here is the atelectasis, no? Yeah, so okay. the reason I think that's atelectasis A is because you have no plural margin. So the reason you don't have plural margin is you have no aeration. There's no air coming into this lung. Mm -hmm. Whereas here you do have aeration. So there's air able to reach the plural margin. So again, if you're in a situation where you have a complete lack of aeration with disappearance of the plural margin, and again, what, what I'd say is that you have lung that's consolidated, then that is more likely to reflect atelectasis. And that's how you differentiate consolidation from atelectasis. But they would both be C profiles. This is a B dash profile, actually. This is a C profile for you. Okay. And the reason I call that a B dash profile is this is B. So this is a B profile. This is probably a compact B line. This is consolidation. So a C profile, so it coexists. The plural margin is not moving in this region. Hence, I've given this as an example of B dash. Over here, what you can see again is a B profile, very poor plural sliding. So B dash over here, but this is classically a C profile with atelectasis. So now do you understand the difference? Does anybody have any confusion about this? Please ask yes, me. Yes, I look, I look, please, uh, for uh, bronchogram, in, in atelectasis, we, we should have a static uh, bronchogram, right? So can you see a lot of movement in the bronchogram there? I can't. Yes, we so can't, which, we can't, I can't see. Yeah, and I can't see a plural margin, which is why I think this is atelectasis. So while these are both C profiles, this is atelectasis is my clinical feeling. And this for me is a consolidation, a pure consolidation, because you can see the plural margin. So there must be aeration of this part. Sorry, Alo, can you uh, just uh, repeat again this part? Why, uh, with the absence of at, um, a plural margin, I, I should think about atelectasis more than consolidation? So when lung collapses, all the alveoli are collapsed. So because all the alveoli are collapsed, can you have air in that? No. Okay. So if you have no air, air can't get to the plural margin, so the plural disappears. When you have consolidation, consolidation occurs for a variety of reasons. There is exudate and fluid in the alveoli and interstitial fluid in the interlobular space. But air can get into that exudate, in and out. Mm. So because air can get in and out, it will and can reach the plural margin. Hence, I think a complete atelectasis is unlikely here. Yeah. Now, why I'm saying this is very difficult is because even for the experts, differentiating collapse consolidation can be very difficult. Differentiating atelectasis from consolidation can be very, very, very difficult. And really what I'd say is that if we want to use X-ray in that situation to kind of look at that and try and make a diagnosis, because with an atelectasis, they'll be heart pulled towards your shadow. There will be rib crowding. And again, I would ask you on lung ultrasound to look at those things. Can you see a rib crowding? Can you see the ribs closer together? Can you see? And a very good example is, uh, and I'll share a case with you in due course, where you've got severe atelectasis of the right side of the lung. And actually what you can see is you can see the heart shadow completely into the right side of the lung, whereas you should see it on the left. So again, you're making a diagnosis of atelectasis versus consolidation, which are both C profiles by looking at that. But in the middle over here, what you've got is virtually absent plural sliding with what is one very big compact B line. And that is for you a B dash profile. Great. So Thank if you. I, Hello, yeah, yeah. Can I ask something? Please. So when you talk in consolidation, you are thinking pneumonia. Uh, no, not necessarily. As we've described, there are various types of consolidation. I will cover this in okay. a lot of detail. So subplural consolidations, which you see that are minute and are below the, the plural margin in RDS, they're also consolidations. Yes. 
a deep consolidation is also a consolidation. What it reflects is an area of lung that is less well aerated, possibly because there's fluid in it, because there's exudate in it, or as in highline membrane disease, there's a highline membrane which is preventing aeration of the subpleural area of the lung. But air can still get in and out. And again, when I talk about it, I think if you had dynamic air bronchograms, and unfortunately in these two images, you don't have dynamic air bronchograms. Dynamic air bronchograms basically reflect air getting in and out. And that would be a feature of consolidation as opposed to complete atelectasis. In complete atelectasis, air can't get in and out. So you cannot see dynamic air bronchograms or fluid bronchograms. But for all practical purposes, when I cover this in more detail next month, you'll be able to understand this better. Okay. What I want you to get a feel of today is the different profiles that we've talked about, A profile, B profile, C profile. If you don't have plural sliding and you have what is uh, a barcode sign, that's an A dash profile. If you kind of have a B profile with little or no plural sliding, that's called a B dash profile. And a B dash profile and B profile can both have reflection that indicates pneumonia, increased alveolar interstitial space. It's just a classification that's been given by Daniel Lichtenstein. The reason he talks about the B-dash profile, and I'll talk about that when I cover the blue protocol, is because there's a plaps point at the back. And if you, if, if you don't actually look in that region, you will miss an ammonia, including in babies. And then you have this kind of overlapping profile that we classically call the AB profile. There is a profile where the right lung can have an A profile and the left lung can have a B profile because you have an ammonia in the left lung. And that is different to AB profile that we describe, which is classically transitioning lung. That has been described in Daniel Lichtenstein's classification for the blue protocol. And that is usually an indicator of pneumonia. So if I just take you back to the blue protocol. <clears throat> this is the blue protocol. And this is what they say, that if you're trying to determine what pathology there is, the first thing you have to look at is the pleura, define it, what features, sliding, no sliding. Then if you kind of have an A profile, clearly from your perspective, if there's lung sliding with an A profile, well, this could be normal, but there are some A profiles where if you look at the back at the plaps point, you can see what looks like a B profile, which would indicate a pneumonia. If you have abolished lung sliding, then you have an A dash profile, which indicates a pneumothorax. Uh, obviously, if you don't have a lung point, that's a massive tension pneumothorax. So he's basically used this classification to give you a clinical classification for diagnosis in adults. I will be providing you a similar classification for neonates as we go forwards. Okay. I'm very quickly, because I've nearly killed you all and our two hours are up uh, and I have three minutes. Uh, I'm just quickly gonna go through the questions that you've asked in the messages. So Sharif has asked me, what is AIS? So alveolar interstitial syndrome is basically a condition where what happens is you have increasing interstitial fluid. So as you can see over here, as interstitial fluid in the interlobular septa goes up, and if I just show you this image that I previously spoke about. So as this fluid goes up, fluid will basically cause B lines to merge, but eventually your alveoli will also have fluid in them. Now, if you have fluid in the interlobular septa and fluid in the, the kind of alveoli, what you'll get is this pattern of complete whiteness. Now, if that whiteness is seen in one lung area, but not in another lung area, we call it AIS. So a classical example that I'll give you by showing you the image here is here. That you've kind of got this area here where you've got a compact B line that's merged, but you still have areas that you can see in between with the rib shadows that actually show that the B lines are separated. Now, classically, if you get these entire areas which are coalesced together, then this is classically what we call a white lung appearance. 
Alveolar interstitial syndrome basically means that you can't differentiate compact B lines. So here you can't differentiate compact B lines. So it's just an increasing grade of alveolar edema because of increased fluid in the interstitial space. If you see it in less than one lung field, because we're going to see R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. So if you kind of see R1, R2 uh, having an AB profile, but we know that fluid settles to the back of the lungs. So if you see that at the back of the lungs, what you'll probably get is this is the front because gravity causes fluid to settle. So you'll get an AIS pattern in the axilla in the back. So it's just progression of fluid. And my, my advice would be, once you start doing lung ultrasound, when you go to the posterior regions, you'll, you'll see more of it. Uh, what else? What is M mode? So M mode basically is a two dimensional image of, of, of the, the lung field. So here, what you're seeing is you're seeing skin, you're seeing rib, you're seeing pleural line, you're seeing these A lines, and you see these kind of comet tail artifacts. Now, this is what the ultrasound is showing you. If you were to put a line through this, if I were to put a line through this, this line at this particular point would give me a geometrical image. And this is the geometrical image. Can you see this line? So what it's basically showing me is this area here. And this is, this is the geometrical image that I get with this line. That's what we call as M-mode. Mike, I'll explain C lines again. Don't worry. Uh, we'll talk about lung pulse and static bronchograms. We have discussed it previously. Uh, yep, pretty much like CFAM. You're looking at it at one point of time. So the raw EEG would kind of be the M-mode. Whereas the kind of combination of everything is what you see on the amplitude integrated EEG. One last question, one last question. So I'm not gonna cover lung transition today. We'll keep that for the next talk when I do RDS and transintegrate now. Anybody have one last question? Uh, Dr. Alok, hmm. uh, in this summary of profile, A profile and A dash profile, they are the same. No, they're not. So in A dash profile, you don't have pleural sliding. Because the, the, the here mentioned pleural sliding present. My apologies. That's that's a mistake. Well, mm. very sharp, very sharp. I'm really mm. grateful. It should say pleural sliding absent. Yeah, yeah. I was confused. I apologize. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I apologize about killing all of you. Uh, I think from my perspective, what I'd say is this is a really important talk that I would like you to kind of get uh, familiar with. So uh, by all means, uh, I won't be able to revise this one. So from next week onwards, we're starting the abnormal lung. We're going to be discussing RDS and TTN. So we have a break for a week. The next session is on the 6th. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful for your patience.